to use local information and data from the past three weeks in the five primary areas to determine the risk of COVID-19 to the public. Most of the data is available to the public on the COVID-19 um, dashboard. The website also includes an explanation of the metrics we use to determine the dial position. You will find that just underneath the dial on the website. One primary factor is the number of new cases. This week so far, 457 cases have been reported. Our weekly case counts have risen to a very concerning level. Since the beginning of September, we have had over 3,700 new cases. This represents about 50% of all the cases reported since the beginning of the pandemic. This has been a major factor in pushing us up to elevated orange on the risk dial. Since September 27, or over the past three weeks, 40.6% of all new cases have been between the ages of 30 and 59. This age group represents the majority of working adults in our community. These actions of these adults are further spreading the virus throughout the community and affecting all age groups. The seven day rolling average shows the high number of cases we have seen over an extended period of time. The fairly flat trend line shows daily cases average in the mid 80s and then going up to the 90s this week. We have seen these very high levels of cases for six weeks now. A second factor is our positivity rate. The average weekly positivity rate remains in the teens, as it has for nearly the past seven weeks. However, we have seen a decrease since the week ending <clears throat> September 26, when we saw a high of 14.6%. The decrease in weekly positivity rate is mostly due to requirement for the center <clears throat> from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services that healthcare workers and residents at long-term care facilities complete multiple tests per week. Another factor is laboratory testing capacity and turnaround time. While testing remains widely available in our community, the effectiveness of testing is highly dependent on how quickly the laboratory results are provided to our health department. Over the past two weeks, the average turnaround time has increased by almost two days. So far this week, the average turnaround time has been 3.9 overall. The average time for Test Nebraska, which does a high volume of testing in Lincoln, is about 4.2 days. And overall, just 36% of our tests were received within two days or less over the past week. The sooner test results are received from the labs, the sooner public health nurses can begin the important step of contact tracing, which is the critical part in preventing community spread and outbreaks. Our public health nurses are making contact with, within 24 hours of receiving notification from the state on positive tests. However, due to the nearly four day turnaround time, our nurses typically have not been able to contact patients until five or six days after they were tested. Obviously, contacting people almost a week after they were tested makes contact tracing much less effective in preventing the spread of illness in our community. It is also important that those who test positive do all they can to cooperate with our public health nurses. The fifth primary factor is the number of people hospitalized for COVID-19. As we have been reporting, the number of COVID-19 patients in Lincoln has remained high over the past few weeks. The average daily number of COVID-19 <coughs> hospitalizations increased from 18 in August to 40 in September. So far in October, the average is up to 60. Fortunately, we have seen a decrease this week. Today, 55 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized with three on ventilators. 24 of these patients are Lancaster County residents and 31 are from outside our community. The map, this map shows how the metrics associated with these primary factors are plotted on the color-coded risk dial. Almost all of our measures have moved further toward the upper right portion of the chart. We now have no metrics in green. 
The metrics of testing availability and contact tracing are in yellow. Connected cases, ICU availability, positivity rate, and testing turnaround time are all in elevated orange. And the remaining metrics of community spread, average daily hospitalizations, cases, and case per 1,000 population are in red. You will find the location of the risk dial represented by the blue square outline in red in the elevated orange section. Our health department, your health department, is working 24 hours a day to fill, fulfill our mission to protect and promote the public's health. Our outstanding health care system and the professionals who provide these services are working long hours and risking their own health to care for patients. Schools continue to do their part to take the necessary steps to maintain safe learning environments for teachers and students. The best way to show our appreciation is for each and every one of us to recognize the gravity of this pandemic in our local situation. Many people are getting seriously ill, and COVID-19 has caused 35 of our friends, neighbors, relatives, and coworkers to lose their lives too soon in our community. We now have lost 500 Nebraskans to this virus. The science is clear, masks work. Physical distancing works, washing your hands work, and this virus is extremely contagious. One person not following these simple precautions can impact the health of our community. Our contact tracing is showing us that many of those who become positive for COVID-19 attended family gatherings or went to a party or hung out with their regular circle of friends, but they did not follow the three precautions. These are the perfect environments for COVID-19 to spread. Of course, we remain concerned about large gatherings, but these smaller gatherings of people who are ta not taking the necessary precautions are a big contributor to the continued spread of illness and our increased hospitalizations. We know cold weather will cause people to move indoors, and that increases the risk of close contact. If you are gathering with people outside your household, even other family members. Make sure everyone is wearing a mask and staying at least six feet apart. We also need cooperation of all the businesses with the safety measures that protect their patrons and employees. When you keep yourself and your family safe, you prevent illness, hospitalizations, and death. You help to keep our schools and businesses open. We can still enjoy life during this pandemic, but we must do it in smart, safe ways. Before I turn back to the mayor, I do want to mention that this is election season, and we have had some reports that some individuals are canvassing door to door without wearing masks and gloves. If volunteers choose to do this um, type of information sharing, we ask that they wear masks and gloves when speaking with people or handing out materials. Thank you, Director Lopez. Our data tells us that the risk of contracting COVID-19 in our community is higher now than it has been for many weeks. Experts like Dr. James Lawler from UNMC have emphasized that we are entering a dangerous period for our state in the course of this pandemic. This is not the time to ignore warnings and public health messages that are meant to keep us all safe. As difficult as it is, one of the most important steps we can take is to limit our interactions with those outside of our immediate household. When we do interact with those outside our household, we need to be smart to stay safe. Follow the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance, keeping six feet between yourself and others. Avoid the three C's, avoid crowded places, confined spaces, and close contact with others. Even with these smart steps uh, we are taking to stay safe during a pandemic, we can still enjoy our lives. We can still enjoy Halloween. We just need to focus on safety this year. And you'll find many ideas and recommendations on our COVID-19 website. We can still enjoy football season. Home gating is the buzzword this year. And again, you'll find tips and recommendations for safe game day celebrations at our COVID-19 website. If we all practice and respect the safety guidelines, we can slow the spread of the virus and still experience things that bring us joy. 
We must all take responsibility and work together to consistently do three simple things. Wear a mask, watch your distance, and wash your hands. And we must all take responsibility and work together to consistently avoid three simple things. Avoid crowded places, confined spaces, and close contact. Taking responsibility and working together, we can beat COVID. And we need to beat COVID because so much is at stake. Not only our health and our healthcare system, but also the education of our children and the success and recovery of our businesses. As part of our Lincoln Forward initiative, my administration is actively working to support local businesses and our local economy's recovery from the impacts of the pandemic. We will periodically share updates on the implementation of the recommendations of our Economic Recovery Task Force that I convened earlier this year. That task force released a report last month with recommended strategies by which we all, residents and employers alike, can participate in Lincoln's economic recovery. One of those recommendations was to cultivate more opportunities for direct business-to-business -business or B2B support on topics relevant and timely for our business community. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the first in a series of B2B town halls will take place virtually on October 29th at 3 p.m. The topic is employee mental health and social connectedness, and businesses will have the opportunity to exchange information, experience, and resources. Featured speakers include Gail Sutter, Executive Director of Continuum EAP, a local provider of employee assistance programming, Samantha Dolezal, well-being advocate for Union Bank and Trust, and Angela Garbutz, chef and owner of Goldenrod Pastries. These speakers will provide strategies, including no-cost strategies, that employers can readily implement to promote employee well-being. For information on how to participate, go to the City of Lincoln's Facebook page and sign up. And a huge thanks to the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce for hosting that event. And with that, we'd open it up for questions. Do we have a question from Brent? Uh, yeah, this is Brent with Channel 8. I have a question for Director Lopez, please. Right. She'll be right here. Yes, Brent. Uh, yesterday, LPS announced a volleyball game with Lincoln Southeast was canceled after a potential high-risk exposure at a non-school event. And LPS said they're working with the health department to do contact tracing. I was just wondering, uh, can you tell us where that contact tracing stands and uh, if you've narrowed it down to a specific event and what that event is? Uh, we did. Uh, we have been continuing to work on the contact tracing. Um, but it was narrowed to an event that took place on campus that wasn't a school activity that involved all the players and an end of, they were in contact with someone who's positive. So it took place at Lincoln Southeast? That's understanding that it was an event that was arranged there that students participated in, which isn't an unusual thing. But unfortunately, there was someone uh, who was positive. They weren't uh, being distanced, and they didn't wear masks. And it was the person who was positive they were in contact with a Southeast student or a member of the volleyball team? You know, Brent, I'm, um, I'm not really able to share that information. Uh, one more for you, I guess. Uh, Pinnacle Bank Arena announced and then canceled a Husker watch party. Just wanted to be clear, did they get authorization from you and the health department before announcing that event? We're, we were in discussions with uh, Pinnacle Bank Arena on several occasions over different events and uh, have worked through them with multiple different types of plans. And I think they went forward with the announcement and then uh, we're speaking with us uh, a little bit later in that situation. 
What uh, what was the determining factor in that event being called off? You know, I um, the health department did not call off that event. Um, I think uh, Tom canceled the event after reviewing carefully what was happening in the community, and that's the type of partner he's been all along to protect the community and his staff. So uh, after further review, he made that decision, which we fully support and appreciate, and we continue to work very closely with him. Director Lopez, this is Bill with 1011. Of the 7,900 cases, and I know this would be extremely rare, but do you know how many of those are reinfections or if that's happened at all in Lancaster County? You know, uh, Bill, I'm going to answer you off the top of my head, so I have to, uh, I'd have to re-verify this with you. I believe we have had one situation of reinfection, and it has been, you're right, very rare. Um, I hear my other health department colleagues uh, make comments about reinfection, and it's something we are continuously monitoring, and we actually have a system to notify the state and follow up on reinfections. Thank you. Uh huh. Was that recent or was that a while ago? It was a while ago. Hi, this is Maya with Came TV. Um, with Husker Games beginning here soon, can you emphasize again what precautions will be made uh, for people who want to go out and tailgate? Um, in our community, we actually have tailgating guidance posted on our website. Um, and it's really trying to limit, um, of course, we're encouraging people to home gate, but those that are tailgating, uh, we worked with the venues that provide that. They have done additional spacing in between areas. Uh, they've asked people to limit the number of people they have there, bring their own food and drinks, and keep the group smaller. And in Lincoln, we've also done a great deal with dine out and that's to reduce the density in our bars and restaurants. So some of our streets are closed. There's additional dining uh, and service that's allowed out beyond just the internal restaurant uh, situation. And for people, do you have any extra precautions that hotels um, or, for example, Airbnb should be following just in case there are extra people coming from other parts of the state who will still try to participate in activities there? Yes, and I want to go back a little bit to Diane. I'll talk to you about that. You know, in Lincoln, we do, our directed health measures requires people to be seated in groups of eight to be distanced six feet apart and to remain seating um, and only taking a mask off to eat their food or have their drink. That's one difference. We have worked with all of our uh, hotels. We continue to work with them on safe practices. Uh, and we are actually putting out signage and they're sharing signage and information with people coming into our community that may be coming from areas where their directed health measures are different or they're not, uh, maybe they aren't having the outbreak con condition we're having here, or maybe they're coming from an area that has an even larger outbreak. So yes, we have all that information available uh, to our Airbnbs and to our hotels, and we work very closely with the industry. So there'll be signage coming up uh, out around the city about what people need to do to stay safe. As it starts to get colder, um, are you offering any support for local businesses to have things outside, for example, outdoor heaters or close down a street so that they can have dining options outside? Um, is there any support from the city on that? Actually, that's what dine out is about, is, is being outside. And I'm going to let the mayor say a little more about that. But that's what it actually is. There are streets closed, and that's available. As far as the heaters, I haven't talked about that, with, but I'm sure our business owners will take care of that um, to be able to have people there and be safe and be comfortable. Just to follow up, the Dine Out Lincoln program is meant to be an innovative way to adapt to our current circumstances to support our businesses. Our urban development team 
worked with our uh, restaurants and bars and the state and the Liquor Commission and our council to help provide this uh, new way of doing business that allows us to increase the capacity of bars and restaurants, which have, of course, been impacted disproportionately by the pandemic, uh, but to not uh, increase the density of patrons so that we can keep people safe. And as Director Lopez said, all along through this pandemic, our um, directed health measures, um, when we've when, what we've done is to make sure that we have six feet of distance in restaurants, uh, along with masking. From the very beginning, we thought that that was very important. So, um, again, we're doing everything we can to keep people safe, to make dining out an option for those who feel comfortable doing so, uh, and to support our businesses in the process. Mayor, this is Bill again. Based on the, the new directed health measure uh, from the governor, if, if a restaurant is approved and they can expand into uh, the sidewalk or even the street, would they still have to abide by the people, people need to remain seated rules or would people be able to stand and congregate uh, in those outdoor areas? Uh, they need to remain seated. That's another part of the safety measures that we have in place is to try to prevent that close contact and crowdedness. That those are, if we're trying to avoid the three C's, staying seated and only getting up to um, use the restroom or go to the bar is, is, a, is a, a key strategy. Other questions? Just Mayor, just sorry, oh, sorry, Mayor, just uh, one last, um, if you can just, I know you guys sent out the SDLs on game days um, information sheet. Can you just do a quick recap for that on, on what that means for the businesses that can, that will be able to get that license and, and kind of how you're monitoring that? Right. Another adaptation we're making this year is that we are allowing special designated licenses uh, on Husker home game days and game days in general. In the past, we haven't been able to do this because the, the um, security needed to pull these special designated licenses off safely um, has not been available. Those uh, off-duty police officers are typically helping to provide support for the stadium for traffic on game days. So. Knowing that we won't have fans in the stadium, we've made an exception to past practice, adapting to current conditions, and are working with local businesses to try to accommodate these, you know, outdoor sort of special tailgating type events. Um, because we know that when people are outside, they're safer than in close, confined indoor spaces. So we're trying our best to support safe activity on these game days. Um, that doesn't mean that we have infinite resources. As, um, as you're well aware, we have one of the smallest police forces per capita, per population in the country. And so uh, we don't have an infinite supply of off-duty officers to support these events. That said, we're working with our special, special events team to create a fair process by which people can apply for that support for their special events on game days. And we're working through that process. We've got information online about that. and. Uh, we're happy to do what we can to make those activities come off safely and successfully. Other questions? Hi, Mayor Andrew Ozaki from Channel 7. Maybe you answered this. I'm sorry, I had to leave for a couple seconds. But uh, are you considering tightening up any more uh, directed health measures or, or anything else? I know that the governor just announced some uh, today. Right. Well, um, we're just getting to look at the directed health measure announced by the governor today. But at a glance, what I see is a movement more to align with Lincoln and Lancaster County, which is great because we have been in phase three over the past weeks because we um, have been monitoring multiple indicators, not just hospital data. And so um, we are going to have to make some adjustments. We want to align. We see that in the new measures from the state, some of these large gatherings will have a uh, like an up to 10,000 person limit. We'll adjust ours down from the up to 30,000 to align with the state. So we'll, we'll be making some minor adjustments, but uh, in large part, I think we're coming closer together as a state and a county as a result of the governor's kind of reversal of some of the phase four that he had implemented in the past. 
And Director Lopez, I was wondering if I could just ask you a quick question about, you know, uh, there's been a renewed, I guess, call possibly for herd immunity and just to protect maybe some of those uh, long-term care facilities. H have you looked at, you know, what would happen if, if you did something like that? Have you run the matrix on that? Andrew, I'm not sure I completely understood what you just asked me. <laughs> there seems to be maybe another call for at this point, why don't we just go to herd immunity, uh, allow for young people to um, you know, catch this virus and then just protect those uh, that are vulnerable like long-term care facilities. Have you run the matrix or, or what would happen if we, if we did at this particular point in time go to herd immunity uh, type of a philosophy? You know, if, if we were to do that, I, I know, um, actually, we were just having a discussion about this this morning with Dr. Lawler from Nebraska Medicine, uh, the infectious disease specialist. And just to tell you, give you an idea, I know there have been some articles out recently about this. And just to put it in perspective, we would have to lose almost 1.9 million people in the United States would need to die as part of that, an additional 3 million people or more. I'm just talking off the top of my head from two of the numbers I remember uh, would have to have the disease. So going to herd immunity is really not an answer. It's not anything in the United States or in public health we have ever encouraged in the past. And I really think that would be moving towards a step backwards. What we really need to do is have people follow the three Cs wash their hands and wear a mask and watch their distance and we can really make a huge difference. Um, it's the people coming in that have to work in the care centers where there's issues going on and this increased testing is very wearing on our long-term care centers um, and we're very concerned and we're working very closely with them here in Lincoln and providing support and we've spoken with the governor and we're asking for additional resources uh, for them and I know the governor is addressing that. Other questions? Yes, uh, Kent Walgamot from the Journal Star here. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the SDLs would still have to operate under the directed health measure of masking and distancing and all of that. Yes. In the street. Yes. Right? I try to be consistent. <laughs> and the uh, the rotation uh, looks like it's three uh, places: the Canopy Street uh, Rail Yard and or, and Fourteenth and O. Is that yeah, yeah, I'm gonna ask John Carlson to come up. He's worked uh, closely with our special events team and uh, the folks at the city who have worked through this process and he can provide more granular level of detail. But yes, it's, a, it's about managing our limited resources to try to support everyone as fairly as possible. I can, how can I help? It looks to me like uh, on the, the chart that was sent out, there's basically three places that these SDLs are going to, uh, on game days, are going to happen. Right. Three major public requests have three major areas, Canopy Street, and then a little bit farther east, which would be Haymarket, 8th Street, kind of P Street, and then farther east yet on 14th Street. And it's a rotation system uh, that you came up with, or? Right. When we look at the capacities and the, the off-duty resources and the traffic control necessary, we can't really accommodate three, but we can probably accommodate two. So in order to figure out, we figured out they need to do a rotation and kind of take turns. So each person gets to go. do it on away game days as well. Right. So on away games, the, the, uh, the previous ordinance allowed SDLs on away games. And so this is just addresses SDLs on home games and the current change in circumstances. Okay, thank you. You bet. Any further, Any questions? further questions? 
All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to find out how to keep our friends, our family, and our neighbors safe during this pandemic. Remember those three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and avoid the three C's, avoid close uh, contact, confined spaces, and, um, <laughs> and the other one, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, crowded places. There we go, they rhyme. Um, we really appreciate the care with which our community is taking this seriously. We've been doing a great job in Lincoln and Lancaster County. We've got to continue to educate all the students and folks who came back into town at the beginning of the school year, educate our friends, families, and neighbors as they, as they naturally want to be in small gatherings about how to be safe. And you can do that by continuing to visit our website, covid19.lincoln.ne.gov, for the latest information about how to protect yourself and your loved ones. Thank you so much.